How's it chaps and welcome back to the Burden Bowls Garage. In today's episode, we are doing another tool teardown. Um, today, we are tearing down DeVault's cordless grinder. This is the 18 volt XR version. If you are from the States, it might be called the 20 volt XR version. It's the same tool. Um, it's not a brushless tool. It's one of the brushed tools. And the model number is DCG412. Type 10, it's the 10th iteration of this model. It's got 405 watts and 125 millimeter diameter disc with a 14 millimeter spindle. Now, my feedback on this, I've had it for about one year now, maybe a little over one year, and I've used it a fair amount. It's got enough power, but um, I don't use it a heck of a lot. Reason being is because I've got those grinders, uh, they are plugged in all of the time, and they've got various discs on, cutting discs, sanding discs, that type of thing. So I really only use this um, for odd jobs outside and when I really need to quickly cut something. Um, overall, I'm fairly happy with the build quality and we are tearing it down, not because it's broken, it does still work. Well, if you unlock it. <laughs> um, so just to have a look at what it's like inside. Anyway, let's get started. To take this apart, uh, fairly simple. There's just five T15 fasteners to remove that's on the clamshell side and then on the top here there is four t20 fasteners to remove that'll remove the whole gearbox housing and the head assembly one more thing chaps if you are going to tear down your tools don't be a moron remove the battery uh, these things are not toys <laughs> and uh, you are going to come off second best if this thing starts up in your hand i reckon the first thing to do is just to remove the blade and the blade guard make things a little bit easier to to get into I suppose we can also take this flange plate off Ugh, somehow. Wow, it's pretty stuck on there. Come on, man. Oh, there we go. Just that little rubber o ring that was causing a little bit of grief. I reckon the second step is to remove the head. That's these four T20 fasteners. And last but not least, the five clamshell fasteners. Okay, first look inside the DeVault DCG412 cordless grinder. This thing shouldn't come off, shouldn't be too difficult to take off. Oh, there we go. Hmm. Quite a beefy motor here. Yeah? Well, I suppose at 400 watts, it should be quite big. The clamshell is made out of PC, so polycarbonate forward slash PBT, which is a polybutylene terephthalate. I'm not a material engineer, so not too sure uh, exactly the properties of these things, uh, but that's the yellow plastic bit. And then the TPE is the thermoplastic elastomer. That is the rubber overmolding that we see. Uh, also nice to see these uh, dovetail ribs that run around the tool. Uh, those those ribs are generally there to help the the rubber adhere and stay adhered to the uh, to the clamshell. Uh, I don't know if you remember in one of the previous videos when we tore down the the Devault Impact wrench. Uh, that was the same type of tool, also a brush tool, also the tenth iteration. And interesting that that one didn't have any of these dovetail ribs on it. I also made mention on that tool that we didn't see any of these holes. Now these little holes here are drilled. Uh, well, not drilled, but I mean they cast into the into the clamshell, and when the overmolding is is overmolded onto the clamshell, uh, the little bit of rubber actually comes through the hole, and those little points. There's many of them on the tool. There's a couple more down here, and uh, those little points help hold or keep the rubber attached to the clamshell over time. There's also some little rubber rubber nibs or ribs, should I say, and a dovetail over there and also over there. Quite nice to see actually. The rest of the inside of the molding looks uh, fairly clean still and in relatively good condition. Quick overview of the internals. Uh, here we've got the battery connector and then above that we've got all of the electronics and the control board. Uh, this bit here is where the MOSFETs and the, are attached to, that's the heat sink. We've of course got the switch mechanism. See there's another ferrite uh, choke 
And uh, at the back here, we've got the brush block, obviously motor and the gearbox towards the front. Hopefully we can uh, get this thing apart without too much damage. Yep, the electronics are just popping out. And I'm fairly certain this motor will just kind of pop out the casing. Yep, there we go. Fairly simple to just lift everything straight out. As it is with uh, most of the other tools, we can see the other half, the clamshell, of course, has the same material markings. They wouldn't be made of different materials. And uh, something to keep in mind, when you are tearing down your tools, uh, not all of them have this, but some of them do. Generally, the tools that vibrate, you can see there's this little spring with a, with a little plastic stopper. Now, that thing is normally situated behind the little battery terminal connector. So what the spring does is it keeps pressure, a uh, forward pressure on the terminal connector so that when you clip your battery in, it presses the terminal backwards and it presses it against this spring and it stops the battery from vibrating um, around in the holder itself. Now, at least this is what I think it is for. That's, uh, that's what it looks like. If any of you know any different, uh, let us know in the comments. The trigger lock is a fairly sturdy little plastic piece and it is made out of ABS. Always a welcoming sight on the upper market tools that we see quite thick battery terminal connectors or spades. Um, of course, the two outer ones being the way the main power is uh, routed through and then these two inner ones usually, as far as I believe, are for communication back and forth with the battery. I do like what I see here. Now these are the main power leads that run up to the switch and further on into the motor. And these power leads or, or wires, conductors, whatever you want to call them, uh, they are crimped into a terminal. And then we can see here that the terminal is actually spot welded onto the battery's uh, connector spade. So I like this type of arrangement. Um, on some of the newer tools, the, the wire or the conductor is just spot welded or spot soldered directly onto the terminal. And uh, like I say, I just prefer this type of arrangement. I think it's a longer lasting arrangement, although slightly more expensive because there's an extra process involved and a little bit of extra material cost when we use one of these terminals. The two central wires, uh, we can see that they've got some heat shrink over them, obviously a lot thinner because those are just generally communication wires. And uh, these two are likely just soldered onto the terminals. Absolutely no problem with that. And the negative wire is also uh, crimped onto a terminal and then the terminal is spot welded to the battery's uh, connector or to the battery's spade. The black plastic piece that you see above the battery is this piece over here and above that is where all of the electronics are housed. Now they are coated in this white celastic material. It's not quite like silicon, it's more like an epoxy type of material and the reason they do this is to prevent moisture and dust ingress and also to help reduce vibration because vibration is a killer of electronics. Uh, this does have a downside though, uh, if anything does go wrong with any of the components it's pretty much impossible to fix. I mean you're not going to pull this, this coating off here without damaging uh, some of the other components underneath here. So uh, you're pretty much going to be stuck with either buying a new tool or buying all of the internals, the complete internal kit again. Speed control on this grinder, or should I say power control, uh, I think would be the more correct term here, um, is achieved by two MOSFETs. There's one on this side, one on that side. The number is RRLB3813, if anybody is interested in checking the data sheets on those. Um, but they are pretty much identical, and both of them are riveted to the heatsink. Now, the heatsink is this section over here, and they do use a the thermal paste between the MOSFET and the heatsink to provide good thermal contact. Um, not exactly sure what they are used for in this case uh, because this this is not a variable speed device it's either on or off um, so and we can see from the battery terminal this red wire runs directly up to the motor and then this white wire comes down from the motor onto the I believe this would be the base of the MOSFET of both MOSFETs so either this is used for a soft start feature or it uh, in some cases, it can be used to maintain motor RPM. So it'll vary the power going to the motor. Um, if the motor is free running, uh, maybe it's drawing 100 watts. And as you start cutting the, the motor speed or the spindle speed starts bogging down. So um, normally you would have, say, hall sensors measuring the speed and sending uh, information back to the confuser here on the bottom. And then um, it would ramp up the power through these through these. MOSFETs. Although in this thing, um, I don't see, I only see brushes up top, which we'll look at later. I don't see any sort of speed sensors or hall sensors or anything like that. So not exactly sure what this would be used for. I suppose just electronic switch uh, to connect 
the motor's current. If any of you know, let us know in the comments. Something different compared to what we are used to seeing. Uh, most of the DeVault products usually use the font switches. Uh, this one uses a Marquardt switch. Now, I believe this is also a fairly large switch manufacturer, and they've been around for many, many years. Checking out the specs on the switch, we can see it's a 30 amp switch with a 24 to 36 volt DC range. Uh, this is within limits because the data sheet for this device specifically says that it is a 405 watt machine and at 18 volts that's roughly 22 and a half to 23 amps. Having a look at the uh, dust ingress protection here, uh, this is the trigger part of the switch and of course the electronics part is in here. Those are connected with a little push rod and having a close look here I don't really see, now it's not very easy to see here, especially on camera, but I don't see any uh, o-ring or wiper or definitely no bellows here to stop dust going inside the switch. Now maybe that is what this little ridge is for over here, there might be an o-ring inside here, not 100% sure, but definitely on a tool like this that when it cuts metal, it ma actually makes metal dust. And if that metal dust gets into the switch, that's likely going to cause unwanted results inside here. I mean, it's it's fairly conductive. Coming out of Alta, what is this? Have a look at this piece of white wire here. Now, this is one of the wires um, that go to the motor, and uh, it's connected to the motor with a flat spade connector, the same as this one over here, and then onto the MOSFET um, that's at the bottom of the device. So it's just spot welded, um, soldered onto a little plate that is riveted down there. But there's a joint. Come now, man. I mean, did you actually run out of wire at the at the factory or something that you couldn't just make this out of a single piece of wire? I mean, the the red wire, which is the same end, it's got a it's got a flat spade connector, and at the other end, it's also spot welded as we saw earlier onto a little terminal. That's a single piece of wire. So this, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, also there is a ferrite choke here. That's just to kind of prevent high frequencies, so to remove a little bit of RF interference. Checking out the tail end of the motor, we can see here it's got the DeVault branding on it and the material marking PPA GF30, which is a polyphthalamide, glass fiber reinforced 30%. I believe this uh, polyphthalamide is it's just a material that's got a good combination of strength and ductility and impact uh, resistance and also a good thermal performance, which is quite important for, say, a brush block at the back of a motor. This thing gets really, really hot. Uh, the motor's leads, we can see here there's two of them and they are connected to the brush block by two flat spade connectors. Those are quite easily removable, you just pull them off the back. And uh, this is a serviceable unit, the brushes, so quite a nice little feature here. Of course there's four of them, one, two, three, four. And when you do need to replace them, this little spring, you can, they, they've got these little nibs here, this little plastic uh, line or, or, or nib sticking out there, and we can just hook the spring over the nib and then the brush comes out no problem um, these brushes are practically brand new because i've only owned this machine for about a year so uh, no need to no need to take them out on second thought uh, to remove the motor the armature and the gearbox uh, from the outer housing here we do need to remove all of the springs so i have done that just unclipped four of them and you can just pull the armature out of the housing having a look inside motor housing we can see that it's made up of four magnets the bearing at the tail section of the armature is a ball bearing just a small little ball bearing and it locates in that black plastic uh, brush housing that we looked at earlier the front of course has also got a, a ball bearing but that is located in the, uh, the aluminium front gearbox housing we'll look at that shortly we can see that the armature has been balanced. There's one, two, three balancing marks. So it is balanced once the complete armature is put together. Also uh, nice to see here is this black uh, epoxy type of material that's cast over the joints. That's the joints between the motor windings and the commutator. Now this is done to try and reduce the likelihood of the winding cracking off the joint uh, to the commutator. That's because there's a lot of expansion and contraction around this area. Of course, also a lot of vibration. Another thing you'll notice here is the plastic uh, fan. It's just a multi-directional fan. The reason I say that is because all of the blades are completely flat. They don't have a specific shape to them. To open the gearbox, it's just uh, four T15 fasteners that need to be removed. It looks like this is a Monday or a Friday tool. Now, the reason I say that is because if you have a look at this rubber ring here, um, a portion of this rubber ring, 
this bit over there has been squashed into the inside of the gearbox. So normally it actually seats in this here little groove, um, but that part <laughs> definitely was not seating. So not sure how the quality control works on this thing. The top of the gearbox, the cover plate is nothing special, just a sintered aluminum type of material. Uh, on the other side, a little bit of grease, and we can see there's a half round recess for that rubber o-ring to seat in. Looking at the gearbox, the pinion looks like it is not a sintered gear, so it's been machined out of a solid piece of steel, just looking at the way the edges have been cut and on the inside of the gear there. Um, but the crown wheel, that's this big one over here, this looks like it is a sintered metal part that has been machined around, of course, where the, the gear teeth are. If you do need to remove the armature, fairly simple to do. You just need to remove this nut that's on the front end of the motor shaft and the entire armature and shaft will slide out the back. Now, it does have a support bearing that is inside here. Uh, for the purposes of, of this teardown, I'm not going to take this apart any further. Um, and also, if you needed to remove the spindle to replace maybe bearings or something, um, then you just unclip this little circlip and the spindle shaft will pull out the front. Um, also, at a guess, uh, not going to tear it down any further. There's going to be two support bearings, one support bearing in the front or at the back, should I say, and then uh, one support bearing at the front of the housing. The front housing looks like it is a sintered aluminium material. Now, uh, it's very thick, quite heavy, uh, fairly sturdy, so I don't think you can have any problems here. So my final thoughts, now that it is back together and working. It's a fairly well-built machine. Well, for what it is, at least. Um, so if you guys have any thoughts about uh, anything that you saw in the video, please put it in the comments section below. It's always nice to hear from you guys. Uh, maybe you've got these and you've had them for many, many years and they've done some hard work and you can actually see what parts of it wear. Um, would be nice to let everybody else know. Um, otherwise, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe already. All of that good stuff. And well, I guess we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.